because my dad was a fighter pilot in World War I, served over in France, and uh, stayed in the service. And I think one of his first assignments after the war was over in Hawaii, where he met my mother, and that's where I was born. And as I said, Dad stayed in the service, so I grew up as what we call an army brat, because he was Air, Air Corps. And uh, all my life, airplanes were, were part of it, from the t earliest memories. Uh, the sound of motors revving up in the morning, you know, pr Liberty engines, DH-4s, and then all the old, you know, the P-1, I remember, the P-6, P-12s. So my whole boyhood was spent around people who flew aircraft, who loved what they were doing, and the airplanes themselves. I think my first ride, I was eight years old. And, of course, having grown up in the service, I wanted to be in it. And the best avenue was uh, through West Point. Um, you know, we've coasted along, everything's normal, normal, and then Pearl Harbor struck. And our big worry was, oh my God, the war will be over before we can get in it, because I was just a sophomore then, had, uh, you know, two and a half years to go. Um, then they announced, they had a big meeting, to see what branch we opted, could opt for. And almost half the class opted for Air Corps, which to the distress of all the infantry and artillery guys who were running West Point. So the summer of 42, they sent us out to primary flight training. And I went to Tulsa, to the Spartan School of Aviation, where we went through primary. So having done that, we went back to the academy, and they had set up a field uh, north of the academy called Stewart. And there we took basic in the fall and advanced in the spring. At the same time, they announced at the beginning of academic year that we were, my class would graduate in three years instead of four. Of course, we nearly tore the roof off the mess hall with our, with our <laughs> happiness, you know. And, but it was, it was fascinating in the sense that uh, we were taking flight training, playing football, and had compressed uh, academics. They didn't cut anything out, they just compressed everything. So, we, as an example, when we started night flying, I would be taken by, we'd go by bus up to Stewart Field, 17 miles, and they had three flight periods in the afternoon. I'd be put on the first period. They'd put me back in a truck, send me down to West Point, change clothes, go out and practice football, get back in a truck, go up to Stewart Field to night fly. And then all of that time, you're supposed to study for academics the next day. And in those days, you got graded every day at every subject. I mean, there's no bell curve. I mean, you, you either passed or you didn't. <laughs> uh, in basic, my instructor was a fellow named Norris, and he was something of a horse's rear end. You know, he'd line us up and inspect us when yeah. we arrived at, up at the airfield. And he'd pace back and forth while we stood at attention, giving us our orders of the day. And he couldn't fly for sour owl, you know what. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Hell, I could fly the BT-13 better than he could, and he knew it. So he said, well, Mr. Old said, you're too big for fighters, so I'm going to send you to bombers. And I just nearly died. So I went to twin engine advance because of him. And he, I'm sure I owe him a career in fighters because I went to P-38s. We went from, we graduated and went out, you know, P-38 training, mostly on the West Coast, and it just took forever. There was a catch-22 at work that we didn't know about. The Pentagon said, we don't want any more of our precious West Pointers going overseas unless they're flight commanders. Fourth Air Force, which we were in, said, we don't want any flight commanders in our operational training units that haven't had more experience yeah. or at least a combat tour. So there we were, caught in the middle. So we got grounded. And a fellow named Al Tucker, a classmate and I, got in the car, went to L.A. Fighter Wing headquarters, found a sergeant in personnel, told him our tale of woe. He was gray-haired, so of course we were calling him sir. We were just a couple of lieutenants. <laughs> he said, you mean, you, mean you, you young men want to go to war? We said, yes. He said, where do you want to go? Twenty minutes later, we had our orders. And we left. We didn't get to um, uh, over to England 
until May, early May of 44. And we started flying missions almost right away, within five days. We had a night takeoff, and we looked at each other in the briefing and said, we're not night fighter, what are they doing? But there was a bridge at uh, chalon sur seon if I say that properly, which we were, the group was supposed to bomb. Okay. Uh, and this was August, so you know the breakthrough at, at the beachhead had already occurred. And so it was a pre-dawn takeoff. Well, taxiing out, I was had the last flight in the last squadron, three squadrons, about 12 airplanes, maybe maybe uh, 16 each. And some idiot ran off the side of the taxiway and got stuck. So he's got everything blocked. Well, since I was tail end Charlie on the perimeter track, I managed to get my flight turned around and we headed back to the cross runway. I lined up with my wingman and I'm telling you, it's black as all get out. We charged down the runway. I've got my landing light on, you know. And I'm just about to pull back on the yoke. And there was another 38 sticking in stuck, sticking out over the runway right in front of me. And I screamed at my wingman, pull! And I jerked that old 38 into the air and I felt a loud thump. You know, that was, everything seemed all right. So up the gear, everything was fine. So I circled like you're supposed to. I couldn't find anybody. Now, one of the squadrons had managed to get airborne before the chaos set in. I could tell they didn't know where they were. They were trying to form up. So I circled a couple of times, there wasn't anybody, so I said, to heck with it. And I just followed the briefing. So I went down to Dover, crossed over into France. Every now and then a little flack would come up, you know, to just say, hey, we know you're there. I was having a ball all by myself. And I could hear that other squadron on the air, and they hadn't a clue where they were. You could tell from the conversation. They finally found the river, and I knew they were south, just by what they were saying. And I came up, and there was a bridge, just at the first crack of dawn. And it was like a black line across a silver river. So I dropped my bombs on the bridge and circled around, got a few tracers, not much, and headed back home. Going across the vineyards, beautiful countryside, the dawn, you know, the sun was coming up, and I'm enjoying this, you know, it's like cross country and the peace, peaceful countryside and two little specks across in front of me about oh maybe two miles out and I knew instinctively that they were Germans just I can't tell you how but you just, you know instinctively so I cut them off at the path I went down and came up behind them and uh, got poor old tail end Charlie quickly lead broke left and we were only about 100 feet off the ground but three quarters of the way around the circle and he pulled up because I'd been hitting him and he bailed mm. out so he landed pretty close to his airplane in this big field so I came around <laughs> and made a pass and I, I think he thought I was going to shoot him uh -uh. I just went over like a dumb young idiot did a victory roll right over and <laughs> flew home of course I Later on, I was smart enough not to do something like that, but, but it was pretty exciting, you know. Then, right. I, then I worried about confirmation because the gun right. camera in the, P50, in the P-38 was right under the 20 millimeter cannon. Some idiot had designed it there. So every time the cannon went off, the, the camera jumped and you could never see anything in your, in your film. So I just kind of put it in my op rep and... Uh, Hub Zemke had just taken over our group, so he called, the briefing with the debriefing was over. He called me and said, uh, "Captain said, uh, did you get in a hassle with some airplanes, some Jerry's?" I said, "Yes, sir." He said, "Well, why'd you talk?" I said, "Well, sir, there's no way I can confirm it." He said, "Oh, yes, you can. There was a group flying right overhead. They saw the whole thing." Oh, now, isn't that something? Yeah. Boy. <laughs> Then less, that was August something or other, about a week later, uh, the hub had us out on a sweep. And I was, again, leading New Cross Blue, which was 434, my flight. And then I was, was I, up, was I flight commander then? I think so by then. 
So I had my flight way out to the left of this huge formation of, of uh, P-38s. We were spread way out on the sweep. And here were little specks out about 11 o'clock. So I, you know, tell you, buddy. <laughs> we sneaked over, and finally I called Lead, uh, whose call sign was Highway. I said, Highway, uh, this is uh, New Cross Blue Lead. We're chasing a bunch of Jerry's. He said, where are you? I said, I don't know, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want anybody to, to share them with anybody. <laughs> And it turned out there were about 55 to 60 of them. And they were in three loose vicks with a bunch of stragglers all, you know, scattered around the rear end. So in my excitement, I finally told my wingman, oh my goodness, uh, drop tanks. So away went the tanks, drop tanks, you know. And I closed in on tail end Charlie and I was just about to shoot and both engines quit. I'd forgot to switch tanks after, oh. after I dropped the, the drop tank. So, so I said, Okay, anyway, I shot, and I got him. So I'm the only fighter pilot that I know of that can claim having shot down an enemy aircraft while in the glide mode. <laughs> I dove away and got both engines started, and the fight continued. It was, but, you know, people say, that was stupid. You know, that number, and you, just two of you? I said, not really. Put yourself in any one of those cockpits in a big gaggle like that, in any one of those cockpits, and just think about it. All of a sudden, one of them screams, Octoon, blah, 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 blah. And every one of them will think, he's behind me, maybe. Are they behind me? How many? They don't know. And the bombers that day never saw an enemy fighter, because my wingman and I had totally broke them up. The worst part was if you tried to split S-38 from altitude, you were in deep, deep trouble because it very, very quickly hit its, its limiting mock. And the shock wave blanked out your elevators, so your yoke just flopped like this, and there was nothing you could do about it. You could pull back, shut off the engines if you like. You're headed straight down. And uh, that happened to me once in that same fight I just described, and I just barely pulled out over a wheat field outside the town of Rostock up on the Baltic. And uh, in my pullout was so violent that I lost part of my canopy, which is kind of startling because the noise level goes up about a hundredfold. And I was looking around to see if, if anything was damaged, and there was a 109 shooting at me. And I thought, now that's not fair. You can see that I'm scared, <laughs> I'm hurting, and I want to go home. But naturally, you know, you, you, you break hard. And with that canopy gone, the airflow sort of awful burble, and I practically stopped in the air. It is, you know, when I broke, well, it's so it felt. The poor guy in the 109 overshot me. And I rolled the wings level, he was right in front, I pulled the trigger and he blew up. So he was number three that yeah. day. I felt sorry for the guy, but you know, you don't yeah. think about that. Uh, from May until Let's see, I think we converted in September of 44. And that was quite a process, really. Uh, uh, I was jumping up and down to fly this plane that had been flown in by a bunch of beautiful WAFs. And uh, the, my squadron commander's briefing checkout was look out for the torque. The crew chief showed me how to start it. And four hours and 15 minutes of flying time later, in a P-51, I was shooting at a Falk Wolf. Didn't hit him either, because they sent me home after I completed my first tour. Said I couldn't just sign up for another one. So I missed all of that great action in December of 44. Oh, okay. yeah. And I went out to California, got myself orders, and went to California, joined the first jet outfit at March Field at P-80. I reported in the text, and he looked at me. I said, Major Olds reporting for duty, sir. He looked at me and said, how in the hell did you get in this outfit? That was my greeting. And I said, sir, I used all the pull I could muster. He said, well, go find something to do. I got so darn many majors running around here, I stumble over them coming to work every morning. So I walked down the hall, and there was an empty desk. I walked in, and the lieutenant colonel was sitting over there, and he, he said, who are you? And I said, Colonel Hill sent me down to work for you, sir. <laughs>
And that afternoon, I went out to the flight line and found a parachute. It was an airplane that was just being buttoned up. I asked the crew chief if it was ready. He said, yes, sir. And I hopped in. I said, will you start it? Because I heard it's not easy to do. <laughs> he started it, and away I went. <laughs> that was my checkout. Was... <laughs> Later on, Pappy Herbst got hold of me, and he and I were the first jet acrobatic team. And uh, our maneuvers were pretty wild, including a split-ass landing out of a loop. Well, what happened was, uh, let's see, I went on an exchange with the RAF for a year, flew the Meteors, wonderful year, came home, we'd, the group had converted to 86s, so then Korea broke. We were sent from March to George to Griffith to Pittsburgh and found ourselves in the Air Defense Command. They took the first fighter group out of Langley and sent them all the way across country to Korea. And uh, I've, I've never got over that because I wanted to go in the worst way. I wound up as a base commander at Pittsburgh and squadron commander. Uh, the uh, challenge was very educational, to say the least. But I put my name on every list and uh, scratched off. And it took me years to find out what was happening. My wife was an actress who was making a television series in New York City. The backer of this series was a friend of the Secretary of the Air Force, and they got together and put a stamp on my record say, don't send him, because the backer didn't want Ella worried about me being in Korea. It took years before I found that out, much after the fact. From there to the Pentagon, which was a in, in many respects, was a good educational process and a hell of a challenge because they fought the system. From the Pentagon to National War College, where I learned to draw caricatures of my classmates because the lectures were boring. <laughs> and from there to the uh, 81st Wing, Bent Waters. From Bent Waters, uh, I pulled a shenanigan to keep from getting promoted to a general. I led a, a formation acrobatic team of F-101Cs, which is not supposed to be done, but we did a hell of a job. And I knew this would uh, irritate, to say the least, my boss down in London. Oh, he was irritated, all right. He said, I was a kind of officer it ought to be in Southeast Asia. And I jumped up. I said, yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I was hoping to say that, sir. And I about faced and left. And he was still shouting at me. Because he took me off the generals as a punishment, which is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so anyway, that's how I wound up in Southeast Asia. It's not easy getting to war. <laughs> well, um, obviously, I went over there. There were two thud wings, F-105s. Takli and Karat in Thailand. I had the 8th attack fighter wing at Uban. And those three wings were the ones doing the almost 90% of the strike up, in, uh, up north. Now, Da Nang would go up north, but not every day as we did. Uh, I found morale was not too good in the 8th. I take a lot of losses. Um, it was easy to fill a much needed requirement as leader. Let me put it that way. That's as delicate as I can get. Uh, my first trips up north around Hanoi just, were just were, I, I startled me. I couldn't believe the tactics that were being employed by the strike force. No wonder they were losing so many people. It took a long time to get that changed because, you know, I'm a new guy on the block. Who am I? I can't say anything. Uh, the wing gained respect when we pulled off Bolo. It was a mission where we went up and uh, managed to bag seven MiGs in one day. So we, we gained respect. And from that point on, things started changing. By March, we were going in and well-disciplined, well-organized, well-thought-out 
formations and, and tactics. We just stop losing people. Let's, let's put that in proper perspective. Um, the Air Force then was was not scraping the barrel. That's that's the wrong term. But they were using their assets. Let's put it that way in terms of pilots. And the longer the war went on, the digger, the deeper you had to dig. So they were training fellows that were, you know, great ATC instructors, air, uh, air defense uh, pilots, interceptor pilots, uh, um, guys from TAC units that were, you know, pretty new pilots, and old guys. So when they arrived, they, they would teach them to fly the F-4, okay? They'd go out on the Gila, ra Gila Bend Range or Cuddy, Cuddyback Lake, and drop little three pound iron bomb, cast iron bombs with a smoke thing in them. And this is teaching them how to fight. Huh. Uh, a little strafing, not much, certainly none in the F-4, uh, or none that I recall. So a kid would walk on the base as a replacement pilot. He might be a captain, he might be a major. He'd have a lot of flying time under his belt, which is good. Um, you know, 2,500 hours, maybe 2,000 hours in jets, but no fighter experience. So he'd walk on the base, look at the F-4 sitting on the parking ramp, loaded with munitions about which he knew nothing. I mean, he had the vaguest clue how to deliver a CBU-24 or, or you know, pods full of rockets. But maybe he knew a little about that. He, maybe he'd fired one or two. Knew nothing about dive bombing, really, and he certainly knew nothing about aerial combat. So it was a it was a really big challenge to train them up to a point where you could fit them into our daily operation. Uh, it worked out well because we had the two seats, you know, in the F in the F four. Um, so I put. They'd all go to ground school to get brought up to date, you know, that, where's the PX, for instance. And I'd put an old guy with a few missions left to go in the front seat and a new kid in the back, even though he's a pilot sometimes. Or I'd put a brand new pilot with an old backseater. Now that old backseater not about to let that guy hurt himself, you know. Uh, that, that worked pretty good. Then we had a brand new squadron or two came from Eglin. And so all of a sudden I'm, I've got two, a whole squadron full of men that, that uh, they think they're combat ready, but they don't really know. And that was a challenge to, to gradually get them, gradually, you know, maybe 12 missions en route back one before I'd send them up north. And I didn't send them until I was satisfied they, they could hang in there and know what they were doing. I'd have Lieutenant Colonels flying, you know, Green Four. Uh, you work your way up the ladder, and you're not going to lead until I think you're ready. The captains would lead, you know. But we would go in like a f eight of us, right behind the thugs, and they'd roll in. And I'd come to a point I'd holler roll, and all eight of us would roll in at once mm -hmm. and go down. So eight of us going down the chute at the same time from a spread out formation. Right? And you converge, of course, but we pickled at 7,500 feet and broke to a predetermined headed, and we're going like hell and getting out of there. Right? It, it really, it worked. And my dive, favorite dive angle was about 65 to 70 degrees, which is practically a split S. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't all that bad. Uh, you see, it, it was a steady influx and outgo. So you had... When the kid had about 20 missions, I mean, he was an old head now. And he could literally bring along the new guys. So, And my policy was when a kid reached uh, about 90 counters, a counter was anything over North Vietnam, um, I'd send him to the easy package, like right north of the DMZ, when he had maybe 10 to go, because I wanted to get him home. And they did a lot of my training. But dropping live ammunition on on targets, but they they, they would 
take their experience and pass it on to the new guys. There was a funny story, if I can uh, clean it up just a bit. We had a new squadron arrive, we gave him a parade. The, the squadron commander was a fellow named, so anyway, he was kind of pompous. We were standing in front of his brand new F F F4D that he brought over. And um, here came the armor with a whole train of bombs on, do on little carts in a tug, and he stopped right in front of this fellow's airplane. And the fellow drew himself up and said, Oh, we're uh, going out tomorrow, are we? And I said, No, Colonel, <laughs> you're not, but your airplane is. He said, Well, that's my airplane. I said, Uh uh, Colonel, it's Bronx of the Eighth Wing now. We'll, we'll use it, you know. Now, don't worry about it. Well, what are you going to do with us? I said, You're going to ground school because you don't know anything. Oh, he was furious. But that's where they went. So we gave them a parade. They're on a flatbed, had a bar set up for them and an umbrella, you know, and all around the base, and everybody's hooting and hollering at them. And on, on my only two-story building, the, the old guys had put up a, a sign made of sheets like that. And they went past it, and they're all looking up at it like that. And they said, if I had a hundred to go, I'd cut my blankety-blank throat. <laughs> oh dear! So in the bar that and you know in the old club at night they'd all sit over by themselves in the corner, you know, with their commander at the head of the table, and we never did that stuff. So the first person in that outfit that flew was a backseater, and he went off with a fellow named Danny Fulgham, who had two missions to go. He had to fly 99 and 100, so naturally he's going to the easy places, you know to get his two last counters. And he's got this kid from the new squadron in the back seat. Well, Danny promptly proceeded to get shot down. And he went out over the Gulf and they punched out. The Navy picked him up, took him to Da Nang, dried him off. They got back to Yuban in time for beer call. Okay? This kid walked in right past his squadron who was sitting over in the corner. You know, their, their eyes are big. A guy goes up. Doesn't come back. Wow, maybe this is serious, you know. <laughs> so, so he walked right by, paid no attention to him. Walked up to the center of the bar, where the old heads hung out, rang the bell, bought around for everybody. Then we started buying him a few drinks. Pretty soon he's sloshed, you know. <laughs> he staggered over to his squadron commander and says, "Sir, I've only got one thing to say to you. If I had a hundred to go, I'd cut my throat." <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, that brought down the house. Uh, they were all good kids, all good men, you know. But first off, let me tell you, that in the middle of June, I heard the rumor that uh, when I got five, they were going to bring me home. I immediately went down to 7th Air Force to try to track it down, and General Moomeyer, the big boss, didn't, said, I don't know anything about that. Turned out it was the public information people. And we had quite an argument, even though the guy's an old friend of mine. I said, that's not fair. I'm here for a year, I'm doing my job, and you're gonna, I'm gonna lose my job if I do my job well. I said, that's not fair. Well, it was all set up back in Washington. So I said, to, to heck with you. I won't get your damn MIG. Commanding that wing is a lot more important than satisfying somebody back in Washington. So I didn't get the MIG. I was in quite a number of fights after that, but, you know, magically nothing worked. So, anyway, I got home on about the 1st of October of 67, uh, on a Friday. Monday morning, I reported in as ordered to the uh, uh, Air Force Chief of Staff's office. His first words to me, when he put his finger under my nose, pointed at my mustache, said, Take it off. I said, Yes, sir. <laughs> that was that for the Mustang. He said, you're going to the Oval Office. I said, oh my God, you know me? He said, yeah, President Johnson wants to welcome you home. I said, oh boy. So over we went and we sat down. It's sort of a welcome home, boy, you done well type of thing. He finally said, what's it? You glad to be home? I said, oh yes, sir, but uh, 
Sir, who were all those funny-looking people that marched on the Pentagon yesterday? And that was when the hippies did that march on the Pentagon, by, just by coincidence. He said, well, they don't understand. He said, I got 240,000 boys over there in Vietnam, and when those boys come home, they'll tell the American public what's going on. And I thought to myself, that's your job. I didn't say it. But I did say, Mr. President, um, <laughs> I've been home since Friday. I've been to two dinner parties. No one has asked me where I've been or what I've been doing for a year. In case someone does, what would you like me to tell them? He glared at me, and he said, well, Colonel, you tell them that we are preventing the North Vietnamese from interfering in the democratic process in South Vietnam. And I, I said, well, sir, I can't say that. He said, why not, Colonel? I think that's the end of being a Colonel. <laughs> I said, sir, because if that's why we're there, I don't want to be the one that spreads the word. And the argument started. And bless his heart, you know, he he listened. But And he ordered me the next day to um, go down to the basement of the White House and talk to his chief security advisor, a man named Walt Rostow. And we argued for a couple of hours. And that's when I I learned that from my point of view, Washington didn't know what the hell they were doing in Southeast Asia, or what they were going to do about it. For instance, in my conversation with Rostow, he said, well, what do you think? I said, sir, they don't have any heavy industry left. Everything that supports their war effort comes in by anything important and in bulk comes in by ship. And the harbors are loaded with ships, many of them are allies, so-called, that mine the harbors. He said, we can't do that. That's an act of war. Can you believe that? Now, I just, you know, I just, you just throw up your hands mentally. You say, how can you talk to these people? Of course, that's what happened later on, and that's how the war ended. We mined yeah. their damn harbors, and by that time, the POWs were a pawn. You'll get your POWs if you get out of here. And America had this campaign going about POW MIA. And they became pawns played on the table for the end of that war. Hmm. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It was a wonderful 30 years right to the day. Um, I like to think I learned a lot. I like to think that I had jobs where I was useful, you know. But I always... Well, I'll say it. I love the people that I that work for me. I did my best knowing my job was to get them what they needed to do their jobs and to take care of them. So it was it was a great 30 years, and um, I had to leave. I had to go far away, Steamboat Springs, because I couldn't bear the thought of being near a military base and listening to the airplanes. And the worst thought was have my social life run by a bunch of retired generals' wives. <laughs> <laughs>